Welcome to Box Office Culture. It has been a minute, and I apologize for that. I have no excuses. But we are back, and honestly, and I mean it this time, we're really going to try to stick to doing this as a weekly show from now on. 15 to 30 minutes tops every week talking about the latest and greatest news information and cool stuff happening in movies and pop culture. Um, Changing up the format a little bit, um, tightening things up, and talking about real things in the moment. This week, we're talking about Marvel. A new Variety cover article hit this week by Tatiana Siegel called Crisis at Marvel, Jonathan Major's Backup Plans, The Marvel's Reshoots, Reviving Original Avengers, and More Issues Revealed. And this article comes from, I I believe it's coming from the publishing of this new book, which I have not yet read, called MCU The Reign of Marvel Studios by Andrew Kishino. Uh, Maybe I'm pronouncing that wrong and I apologize, Andrew. Um, But we're talking about that. We're talking about Marvel, Marvel fatigue. Is it a real thing? We're talking about the Marvels, which is coming out here at the United Theater next week and more. So stay tuned. Joining me today on Box Office Culture is Lee Metzger. Hello. I'm back. Lee and I have done this show a number of times. He's been a regular guest. I've been a guest on his show here on the United Podcast Network called... The Load In. There you go. Come on. Snappy, snappy. At this point, I figure that we're both kind of just the uh, impromptu co-hosts of each other's shows. I think so. I think so. I am going to try, now that we're doing this weekly, no offense to you, to build a bigger bench of people. So that way, I don't have to have you on every week. I, I would love to have you on every week. I love talking to you, but uh-huh. I want to mix it up. So that that's the hope. And, and All I'm... right. Well, this is devastating news. <laughs> um, so just give me a second while I try to recompose myself. I apologize. It's early, it's a Friday morning, and I feel like I just ruined your weekend. It's okay, it's okay. Well, today we're talking about Marvel. Um, And who doesn't love talking about Marvel? Well, I mean, let's talk about that. Uh, Marvel has been such a big talking point for years now. Years. Uh, You know, well over a decade. And I'm wondering, are you sick of talking about Marvel? Kind of. Uh, I've found myself scrolling through Disney+. Plus. And being much more inclined to click on the Star Wars um, stuff now, I'm still like fully locked in with the macro cinematic universe stuff. Yeah, like I love that stuff. I love, I love when you know you point to something and like, oh, that guy's from the other thing. You know, yeah. like I like that. That that tickles the you know, the, the baby part of my brain. It's super unique too. I mean, it's like, um, this idea of creating a cinematic universe, you know, you could, you could argue that there have been little attempts here and there over, you know, past history of, of doing things like that, but not putting a name to it maybe. No. Um, but Marvel kind of rebranded and recreated this whole strategy around synergy, uh, between properties. And, and I mean, I'm, I am a big Bob Iger fan. I think Bob Iger and what he's done at the helm of Disney is is kind of remarkable. You know, buying Star Wars and Marvel, and um, you know, things he's done with Disney Parks and all of that. I'm I'm kind of a a fan of yeah. of what he's done at the corporate level um, to bring on these properties. And 2008 is when the MCU started with Iron Man, um, and we've gone way, way, way beyond that. Bob Iger was kind of the original architect, maybe seeing a little promise there, but the real architect is, is Kevin Feige. And, um, Who cut his teeth on the X-Men movies. Yeah, the, yeah, the old, old X-Men movies. Um, and then created this thing where, you know, we're going to put at the end credit of a movie a little teaser for the next movie and the next superhero we're revealing. And then it grew from there. Mm-hmm. But this art article in Variety, and, and I, I assume this book, MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios, are kind of looking at it with a, a bit of a microscope and saying, let's really look into this, um, the brilliance of it, but also 
the 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 business side of it and and there is a side of business here that seems to um overtake the creative and i think we've reached that a little bit with marvel and that's what this article is about it talks about some recent controversies that we'll we'll touch on briefly um but more so it talks about how much is too much and i think that's kind of the theme of of this conversation we're gonna have um is how much saturation does it take to oversaturate a market um, and a fan base? And Marvel fan base has been fervent and amazing, and people were clamoring for everything that was to come out. There were Marvel podcasts. There, there still are. There, but even that, those conversations at that level are fizzling out, and I think, um, I think fatigue is there. Um, so and your, what, what's your opinion, article aside, what's your personal opinion about about that fatigue, do you think it's there? Do you feel it, and and why do you think it got there? I, I can see it happening. I I watch a lot of YouTube. Um, that's kind of like my my TV is go, going on to YouTube, and I follow all of these channels. Mostly, a lot of the a lot of these hand uh, a lot of these channels I started following because they were doing Marvel breakdowns or Star Wars breakdowns stuff like, you know. A hundred Easter eggs or things that you didn't notice uh, in Ant-Man and the Wasp. And they'll just watch the Plot. entire movie and, like, stop it and, like, all of these different moments and be like, all right, so the thing that was, uh, like, this is a reference to, like, this license plate on this uh, car on the bridge uh, in Spider-Man. It says, you know, blah, blah, blah. It says, you know, a- uh, ASM110. And the reason it says that is because it's Amazing Spider-Man episode or um, uh, volume. What is it? The comic book is it volume, volume one ten or our issue eleven. Issue, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah issue one ten, and then it'll be like uh, that was the that was the one where Spider-Man saves a bunch of people on a bridge. Yeah, and I started watching all of these channels um, for those breakdowns, and now you can see. Um, the fatigue is hitting them. It is because these um, these video breakdowns they're becoming. You can tell that the hosts are beleaguered, they, and yeah. they are like you can see the circles under their eyes. It's just like it's not. You can tell it's not fun for them in the same way that it was before. And like the at the end of the the epi- at the end of the breakdowns, the pleading nature of their like please come back like this is all we're doing and it's hard now and it's not fun and we've got bills that we need to pay and you can just you can see it you know i think this article talks about all kinds of potential issues but i think what they point to and pinpoint as the main issue for this fatigue here is um the push for streaming it's funny and ironic um and the irony that we're doing this from a movie theater and we're a movie Mm. theater podcast is not lost on this, but um, there's this irony about um, streaming and how, how much money streamers are actually hemorrhaging right now. And like, they're just, they're losing money. They're pumping so much money into so many things. And now there's so many streaming services out there that if you honestly, the beauty of streaming was that this was an escape. This was a, a, chance to cut cable Mm -hmm. but now if you if you're like me and you look at all the streaming services you have and you add it up you're paying as much if not more than you were for cable so we've reached a point where it's like meh you know this is too much and there's so much content being pumped out yeah you can't keep up and things some great content even is getting lost but places like disney plus and i love disney plus um but you know they they had a real push that we need new Marvel content all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, if there's not a movie out, there's a new TV show hitting. And they're all tied together. There is no unique one-off property. Everything has to tie into the other thing. The mm-hmm. story arcs have to be continuously moving together, which is an insane thing to first put on writing staff um, to keep up with that. To, to tell stay... a, a full, succinct story, but also leave things open enough for the next Completely disparate show but or you, movie. But the, you have like three writers' rooms, essentially. You know, you have the writers' room for She Hulk, Loki, and Falcon and the and the Winter Soldier. Like at the same click, you have you know four, maybe six, even movies in development 
with different screenwriters and teams there. Uh, you know, Kevin and his team at Marvel need to be the ones that are the architects of the main storyline, the the cinematic universe and how it all ties together. But because of the the push for constant content, um, it's getting muddied mm-hmm. and inconsistent. And then interestingly in this article, they really talk about the visual effects piece too and how taxing it is and how like the visual effects artists from Marvel have unionized because they're being burned out and overworked. And, and some of these things are being released with like uh, not finished effects um, for their premiere or they're adding things in later, like She-Hulk apparently uh, there's this whole sequence of her transforming that was later in the show, but they ended up adding it earlier in the show after, yeah, after it premiered. And so, I mean, you don't do that. You don't put something to screen and then go back and, and change it and fix it. So that, that speaks to a greater problem. Unless here. you're George Lucas. Okay. Yeah, unless you're George <laughs> Lucas. But that, I mean, honestly, that speaks to a greater problem here, which is, you know, it, it is oversaturation at the production level, but then it, that trickles down and, and Marvel was known for the quality. Yeah, You're like, we're going to a Marvel movie. It's going to be great. And now you go to a Marvel movie lately and it feels like, ah, like, it could I be great. I hope that this doesn't suck. Yeah, like Ant-Man Mania is a fun movie, but it is, in my opinion, easily forgettable. Next week, the Marvels is coming out. I have high hopes for the Marvels. I loved Captain Marvel. I love Brie Larson as Captain Marvel. I think... She's like the Superman mm-hmm. of the MCU, um, just so powerful, such an amazing, strong character, and and that the fact that they're they're bringing Miss Marvel and um, uh, Ra- Rambo and it, like all of those characters together in this. What's her name? Photon. Uh, who? Uh, Monica Rambo. I don't know. I don't know. Me neither. But it's Monica Rambo is her character's name. Um, and then Kamala Khan is Miss Marvel. Mm-hmm. But the fact that they're bringing all three of those characters together and, and Samuel L. Jackson, it, it looks fun. It's also, I will say, it's the shortest Marvel movie to date. This I believe like it's like 90-something. It's, it's like an hour 40 minutes about, Oh, which okay. is amazing because that's another problem is they're, they're putting in so much to these movies that they're, they can be a little bloated. You know, with... With Endgame and all of those movies, the, those felt epic and amazing. And those were the culmination of like tw- uh, 15 years or so of buildup, you know? So those... no one would blink an eye if it's no. a three-hour runtime. And everyone, we've sat with these characters, Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, Scarlett Johansson, movie after movie. I mean, we, we love these characters. We cry when Robert Downey Jr. dies oh, yeah. in Endgame. Um, but now, because... Marvel and audiences have this disconnect. They're really trying to think of new creative ways to create that connect again. And they're actually talking about reviving some of the characters like Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man um, because they've, you know, they've retconned a number of times. And you can do that in the comics world because they're comic books and they've created a multiverse. So the storytelling can be a little... um, weak or uh, lazy, I would say, um, if they need it to be, to, to kind of revive some of these characters. But they're really thinking about reviving RDJ and ScarJo. If, if the studio is worried about losing the interest or goodwill of their fans and audiences, trivializing the death of like the main hero of the cinematic universe is not going to ingratiate them with their audience though. Yeah. I think it would be like a kind of a slap in the face almost to like, okay, never mind. Uh, our box office returns aren't good enough. Let's just put the guy up on the screen so that Lee will clap at his TV and point. Enjoy. I mean, Star like Wars has stupid unwashed masses. You could say Star Wars has been doing that. Yeah, with, and they got a bunch of backlash. They, they, they have. You know, they've literally taken dead characters, like the actors have died. Yeah, and like revived them on screen digitally, which is that that grosses me out. Yeah, that seems like a line you should not cross, whether you have the family's permission or not. Um, don't revive the dead mm-hmm. on screen. It's like the whole AI conversations we've had on this this podcast before. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't know though. I I do think 
there is something to be said about reviving some of those characters, maybe not to lead, but have them come back in some way. I, I do think that Marvel went a little deep on like recasting Captain America and the, you know, building up Miss Marvel to be a replacement for Carol Danvers and, uh, you know, trying to find new Natalie Portman, uh, taking over the Thor mantle, yep. things like that. Um, I get it. I like I like the idea of changing things up from a bunch of essentially white people, mm-hmm. uh, men, white men, mm-hmm. uh, to to kind of mix things up. I love that. I love our children being able to look at the screen and say, "Whoa, like that person represents me. That mm-hmm. person looks like me." Um, but at the same time, when you're doing that for the sake of doing it and not putting the care and attention those characters deserve and that equity frankly deserves as well into the stories that you're writing. Uh, I think you're, you're doing a disservice and Marvel has not had a chance at, I believe to really think about and put those really thoughtful stories together because everything feels like a bit of a rush job and it feels like it's all being forcefully tied together. And I think Marvel to their, what they might need to do is rethink the cinematic universe a little bit or spread it out. It's a universe. I've always thought this for Star Wars, too. When Star Wars does their films, and it, they always end up being about the Skywalkers, mm-hmm. and it's like, why are we... Like, um, the the J.J. Abrams uh, films, they're great. I like them, but it's it, you, ha- you ha- literally have a, a full universe at your disposal. Why are we telling the same story about the same family and the same characters? In the same galaxy. In the same galaxy. Yeah. A universe, it's a universe. Um, so that feels like Marvel is doing that a little bit as well. Um, and I'm not saying, like, uh, find obscure characters and, and, like, make movies from obscure Marvel characters no one knows. That's not going to work. I'm saying, well, take, I'm, I'm saying, like, take things like the X-Men, which they now own. Yeah. Revive the X Men, do a '90s. We were talking about this mm-hmm. uh, um, before the podcast. Do a '90s X Men that takes place in the '90s, but don't work so hard to tie it into some greater storyline or greater arc that's going to lead to some culmination movie. No, let the characters and shows and movies be their own thing for a little while. It doesn't all have to tie together. Mm-hmm. There can be a couple little Easter eggs that tie them together, but. Don't build your whole narrative structure on it because if you do and your whole narrative structure is about a character, a villain like Thanos um, or their new character, you know, Jonathan Majors is playing Kang the Conqueror and they're they're hedging all their bets on this character to lead into the next Avengers films and, you know, be kind of the, the culmination of this new phase of Marvel. Well, what happens when that actor has... Yeah, assault allegations and and becomes really problematic because that's what's happening right now. It's another part of this article. It's it's kind of a testament to like, yeah, we did this experiment. It worked. Uh, Endgame was a culmination of it. It was amazing. Uh, we built the MCU. We we built fifteen plus years of movies that tied together. We did it. Experiment successful. Yeah. Let's try something new. And I think that is where they'll benefit most, I, but I don't see them heading in that way. I think what's going to be really interesting is this, um, what's going on with uh, Ahsoka. And not to do a full, uh, you know, about face here, but for, you know, spoiler alert, the ending of Ahsoka, they're basically our main characters are on or in another galaxy. Mm-hmm. And they are going to go on a whole different quest, hopefully to just like explore that galaxy and not just to return to the other one, which is fine if that that's all there is. But they're now in another galaxy. So like kind of the same thing. What if this new X-Men series or this X-Men universe kicks off and we're just we're not even don't even worry about the 616 exactly like tie up 616 we're done we're good like that is that's awesome we loved that universe it kicked whole ass now let's let's 
do something completely different. Like our main characters are no longer Captain America, Iron Man, Spider Man, and this group of people. Now it's Professor X, uh, Cy. What's Cyborg? <laughs> what's his name? Cyclops. Cyclops. Oh yeah, Cyclops. Cy- okay, Cyclops. Yep. Um, and Rogue. Oh, like these are yeah, Wolverine. Not or not even Wolverine. Like friggin' Jubilee. You yeah. know. Yeah. Let's 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 have them be the main characters because Iron Man was a second rate superhero before he was the MCU. Yeah, nobody cared about Iron Man. That's why like they made a movie about it because they were like, yeah, sure, whatever. We'll take the million dollars for the licensing and have you go have fun in your sandbox. Yeah, and then John Favreau, being John Favreau, turned around and made a banger of a movie. And like Ahso- Ahsoka, if they do go that route. They they still have a spectral Skywalker in tow, you know. <laughs> so they true. still have that foundational anchor to uh-huh. the core storyline, and they could make it work. But don't lean so hard on it. And mm-hmm. I think the same could be said if for whatever Marvel ends up doing next. And here's the thing: there is Marvel fatigue for sure. You can see it in the yeah. box office numbers. Guardians of the Galaxy did really well. Ant Man kind of uh, barely broke even, I would say, at the box office. Um, the Marvels, uh, people are saying they, they are not expecting it to open as strong as it needs to. Um, I, I hope it does. I think it looks fun. I'm really excited to see it. Yeah. Uh, but the, the people who are, the, there, there are people out there who are just anti Brie Larson, anti, you know, women led. I think, I think and... some of this is actually coming from like, um, the, the people who do the, the wheeling and dealing money side of, of Hollywood though. I sure. Think, you know, they're, they're predicting early returns are not going to be where they should be. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, the, the last Dr. Strange movie that Sam Raimi directed, that movie was great mm-hmm. and it hit really hard, uh, at the box office. Um, but you can only have so many break evens or yeah. And, and these movies cost so much money, yep. especially in marketing and things like that, that if you don't hit, like half a billion dollars worldwide, then what you're you not doing? a success, which yeah. is, that's a whole other subject. But I think, I, I'm hopeful that the Marvels comes out of it. I, I do think, and I hope that people lean on this idea of like shorter run times. And instead of all of these movies feeling maybe like it's an event that's tied together and you can't miss them because that's what it used to feel like. Hopefully Marvel movies can become like a, and exciting, like, no, we're just going to go. We're going to go have a good time at the movies for an hour and 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. And that's why people end up going to these instead of saying, like, oh, I need to see it first because I need to see the Easter eggs and the, the teasers at the end of the trailers. Let's forget about that stuff now. Let's, like, look at the Marvel movies and reinvent them maybe in a way that is just fun. And it's about going to the movies. Kind of in a way of what's happening with DC, with Joker when jo- uh when joker came out and then the new suicide squad of these movies that don't concern themselves with tying in with the other greater cinematic universe they handed over this property to auteurs and are like tell a story and then they did you know you could argue that joker actually was just a sequel to what's that movie the comedian with oh robert- yeah yeah with robert de niro you yeah. you could say that that was just you know, if you took out all the Joker stuff, it would have just been that movie. Um, and then Suicide Squad is James Gunn just having fun. Well, that's well, that's the other thing is like it can't the irony can't be lost that James Gunn. Yeah. Uh, the the last big big hit for Marvel, which was this past year, was Guardians of the Galaxy, helmed by three, helmed by James Gunn, who yeah. now is the creative head, basically the Kevin Feige of DC. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you got to hold on to those. Those creators, and I those do really wonder. People. I do wonder if there's going to be a switch now. If there's going to be a full, like, sea change to, you know, before or maybe not before, but like when the Chris, Christopher Nolan Batman's were coming out, mm-hmm. DC kind of ruled the public discourse a bit more than they do now. Yeah, uh, more market share at least. Batman did. Batman did. Yes. And then DC tried to, but failed. Yes. I think the DC experiment is a failed experiment and continues to be. It seems cursed in Mm -hmm. some ways. Like The Flash, I watched it. It was there was parts of that movie I enjoyed. Um, but again, like uh, an actor that was extraordinarily problematic and and like almost that movie almost didn't come out. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, 
a wasted opportunity. I think DC also has these great properties like um, the Dark Knight Rises or the Dark Knight Returns. Uh, the Dark Knight Returns by uh, uh, who wrote Dark Knight? It was the comic book. Yeah. Um. I'm, I don't. Oh wait, is it the um Watchman guy? Yeah. Not Miller. Frank Miller. No, not, not Frank, Frank Miller. Miller. Wow. Cut this part out. Anyway, all right. The Dark Knight <laughs> Returns is this amazing comic book that came out, and I always thought, you know, what would be really fun is if they made that movie, um, because it's dark and it's it's Batman, but like he's like old. He's right? old. He's like, I was like, bring Michael Keaton back. Do like a, an R-rated Dark mm-hmm. Knight Returns movie, and then they bring Michael Keaton back for this like really kind of silly Flash movie. So I I think. Michael Keaton as Adam West. It, I mean, he yeah, he lo- he had no edge to him, mm-hmm. and it was it felt like a huge waste. I I want to see Michael Keaton serious in Dark Knight Returns. That's what I want to see. But Michael Keaton as Birdman as Batman. I mean, it almost is that. Like when Birdman came out, I was like, wow, this this is more reason that this would work, but it's never gonna happen. And I think DC, uh, DC to me is the lost cause. Marvel, I hope, doesn't get to that point. Um, but, you know, they have promising things like a new Blade movie with Mahershala Ali in the works. And uh, so I hope they get it together. I think I would I would say anybody who wants to learn more about this or, or kind of read deeper into the inside baseball side of this, go to Variety.com. Check out that article um, we'll by link Tatiana to the, Siegel. Yeah, we'll, li- we'll link to it in the, in the show notes. Yeah, it's, it's their cover article. It's called Crisis at Marvel. It's really interesting, but it le- it ends on this note that says, you know, don't rule Marvel out. Let- let's not forget that Marvel is still making massive amounts of money mm-hmm. um, and has changed the entire, literally, literally the entire, not only cinematic landscape, but streaming landscape as well. Yep. They changed the entire entertainment industry. The MCU shifted the entire entertainment industry. And that's a major thing. Yeah. Um, and it it has good, it has bad. Um, it has good, it has bad. It has good, it has bad. And uh, like anything else, I, I don't know where it goes from here. Yeah. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll see with the Marvels coming out and we'll see what they do and where they pivot to. And Deadpool 3 comes out next year, Wolverine. I- yeah, I was going to say it it will be interesting to see cuz in that article they say um that the budget for Deadpool 3 got cut in half. Mm-hmm. And if we all remember the first Deadpool movie also had a severely limited um it, compared to other MCU movies or other Fox properties at that time, a severely limited um uh budget. So I do wonder what's going to happen because people are going to come out to see that like oh, to see yeah. Wolverine to see for sure. Hugh, Jack- Hugh Jackman Hugh Jackman as Wolverine in Deadpool 3 with his buddy Ryan Reynolds yeah no it's going to be that movie is going to crush rated R rated R yeah hard R for gonna sure be incredible yeah so that it'll be interesting to see what like how how that movie's performance does and then how it informs the it, future for it's Marvel. another testament to writing I think uh, slashing a budget sometimes is a good thing because Mm -hmm. it forces you to think more about story and character and lean more into your characters and what you have instead of effects or, you know, using effects as this kind of blanket coverage for uh, BS, which, you know, like the the Ant-Man Quantumania movie to me was was that. Mm -hmm. It was like, look at all this spectacle with like no plot and the character felt, you know, written as like a punchline in some yeah. ways, uh, lazy writing. And I think, you know, when you slash a budget and you have someone really great writing the script and directing, I think you can have, that's where the magic really happens. Like the first Guardians of the Galaxy, everyone's like, who are the Guardians of the Galaxy? Mm-hmm. Everyone's like, this isn't going to work. Why is Marvel leaning into some really, really unknown, obscure group? Well, it worked. It worked because it was directed and written in a way that was fresh and different and fun and vibrant. Granted, that movie had a massive effects budget, mm-hmm. but it just I'm just using that as an example of like good writing is the key to all of this. Yep. 
and when your good writing is being muddied by studio executives who are saying you have to do this, uh, here's our notes, 40 pages of them, um, changing your entire plot line because it has to tie into these three television series that mm -hmm. we're writing that might not even do that well, but we're, we're committed to them. That's where things go awry, and that's where Marvel is right now. But honestly, I think, I think they could pull out of it, and I think they probably will. I think they will, too. We'll talk about more uh, about Marvel and, and to kind of follow up on this stuff, you know, as new Marvel movies release. But it, this again, this is a really interesting article. Check it out. Um, this is the kind of thing we're going to be talking about week after week. Um, you know, these kind of newsworthy, in-the-moment items related to films, and then occasionally dipping back and, and doing fun things like watching a movie together, um, an old weird movie or something like that, and talking about it. Um, so I'm excited that we're back with Box Office Culture. We're going to be back every week. Um, so stay tuned uh, and come out and see Marvels this week. You're going to enjoy it, I think. Um, and send us your comments. Send us your reviews. We want to know what you think. We'll read some of them back if we get any on the next podcast. All right. Until next week, I'm Tony. This is Lee. This is Box Office Culture. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the United Theatre Podcast Network. If you enjoyed this episode, we encourage you to subscribe to our show so you never miss an episode. And if you could take a moment to leave a review, we'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us create content that you love. So hit that subscribe button and leave us a review, and we'll see you on the next episode.